So both armies had weapons. But the weapons that Zap had were criminalized as weapons of an insurgency. And Zap was also taking care of weapons that belonged to the ANC. That is on records, records of Zapu and records of the ANC. Those weapons were now criminalized. And then there was the murder of those uh, six tourists from uh, Europe. That was conducted by so-called dissidents, which it has come to the fore if you read uh, Kevin Woods. And if you listen to what Patrick Joao said uh, soon after the coup, that uh, that kidnapping of the uh, Tories was choreographed. It was carried out by uh, members of the Central Intelligence Organization simply in order to soil the name of Joshua Nkomo and of that of um, Zapu and Zipra and give credence and justification for a military onslaught onto Matebeleland and the Mikians. It was meant to alarm the world and disgust the world so that they could look aside so that U.S. will look aside, U.K. will look aside as Mugabe massacred the people in the Midlands and um, Matabeleland. And then, uh, uh, after those excuses, what were the dissidents and who were the, were the dissidents? It's important to focus um, and look at the identity and the constitution of who the dissidents were, what they were, and what the nature of their command was. Um, I read uh, my resident, this well-researched book. What I'm trying to do here is to, I, I want to insist first that dissidents existed, that there were people that could be called dissidents and bandits. But now let's go to who were they, what they were, were they about, and what was the nature of their command. I want to insist that dissidents existed, but how were they invented, how were they produced, and what was the nature of their command? I, I think those are the three important questions under this subtopic. I've outlined the arms cache as the, one of the excuses and also the kidnapping of those Tories as one of the excuses. And the Tories were important because they were European and white extraction, which was really to annihilate Zapu and its name in the West and all that. Right. So I say dissidents did exist. First, I was reading uh, Miles this well-researched book, a book that was produced with uh, some of the most admirable social science work that can be witnessed. It's not known by many people that Zanla had dissidents. That uh, is the general Solomon Mujuru instructed 3,000 Zanla guerrillas from Mozambique not to report to the assembly points and remain outside for what they will be needed to do, which was to campaign for Sanupiov during the first independence elections of Zimbabwe. What these dissidents and bandits that did not report to the assembly points were not integrated into the National Army went on to do, nobody knows. But it's a fact that Zanla had its own dissidents that were cre uh, created, they were instructed not to join the National Army not to report to the assembly points and not to go for the retraining that was being done because they needed to be utilized and weaponized um, for political purposes by ZAN PF. Uh, the apartheid regime in South Africa created, promoted, and produced um, its own dissidents that were unleashed into Matebeleland to cause terror, instability, and keep uh, the Zimbabwean entity busy on itself, not on other issues outside the border. You know about Super Zapu, 
and all that. So the apartheid regime was very much interested in dissidents and what dissidents were doing. And there was a, an elite um, coalition, conspiracy between ZANU-PF at intelligence level and the South African apartheid regime at intelligence level. Timothy Scanesia has captured what is in the records here uh, about two kilometers from where I am in the South African uh, declassified um, archives library close to the Union buildings that there was overt cooperation between ZANU-PF and the apartheid regime. And there's one documented meeting which was attended by Emerson Mnangagwa in person as the Minister of Intelligence and Security, where a pact was reached, it's even documented in Scanesia, that ZAPU and the ANC um, are supposed to be finished off on Zimbabwean soil. And that elite intelligence and military pact, which is on record, some disclassified records say that, produced its own dissidents, agents, provocateurs, killers, assassins that feathered the interests of that alliance. And then there were Zebra deserters from the ZNA. Miles and documents how Zebra cadres in the ZNA barracks were hounded, killed, tortured, imprisoned, threatened. Some of them with their guns ran away. Some of them retired early. Others were eliminated and others were put in jail. Uh, in my understanding, this critical narrative, some were saved by Solomon Juru, who alerted them that you are going to be killed, run for your life. Some crossed borders and went to South Africa and other. And those people became what can be called dissidents. And as I said before, there are zebra cutters that foresaw the genocide, especially the Kwai troop, that were uneasy about joining the National Army. And that disobeyed Ngomo and Zapu and ran away into the bush and became deserters. What does that bring us to? It brings us to a picture as to how dissidents came to be. I haven't finished. Besides the disgruntled zebra cutters, uh, there were 50 brigade actors. If you read Kevin Woods, that was at the time an insider in the CIO, in the army, and elsewhere. Um, the CIO choreographed dissidents, soldiers that were taken, dressed in tatters, and sent to villages to pretend to be dissidents, commit crimes, robberies, and other things. And then tomorrow, another group will come in neat fatigues, following up on the dissidents that came yesterday, shooting people, killing them, and doing the diabolic and satanic crimes that I described earlier. So there were dissidents that were actors, uh, that were directed from the CIO and the 5th Brigade. Uh, many people in Cholocho and Kai and elsewhere in Plumtree will tell you that there were dissidents that were moving around and could not even speak fluent Isindebele or Kalanga or Tonga or Venda or Nambia and were calling themselves um, Zipra dissidents that were fighting government and all that. But it was a, all a performance that was meant to justify the onslaught. And then there were Central Intelligence Organization dissidents proper. Uh, Kevin Woods narrates, or should I say confess, because he was part of this act, that there were people like Guy Gusu that were moved around in police vehicles and in CIO vehicles and told to attack farms homesteads, and other strategic targets to create an international picture of instability, insurgency uh, in Matebeleland. 
And many people today know Kaikus as a former dissident. No one knows that Kaikus is a former implant of the CIO in Matebele. And there are many other dissidents of that nature that got known and all that. All that information about the genealogy, the invention, the production of the dissidents has never been confronted as part of this um, epistemicide that I'm talking about. And the important observation there is that there were never any dissidents that were under the command of Joshua Nkomo or Zap. That there were never any dissidents that were an organized group organized by Zapu or Zipra for purposes of toppling the elected government of Zimbabwe. These were disparate groups created by their grievances and their problems, their sponsors, and other interested parties, including ZANU-PF itself, the state, state security ministry, the president, and his elite political clique that commanded the Kukurawundi genocide. When they came to that, the genocide was to deal with the dissidents, they needed to perform dissidents and show that they actually they were dissidents. So they participated in creating, producing, sponsoring, even circulating, uh, distributing dissidents so that they could have a story to say that we have an insurgency that we need to deal with. That, in my view, is the picture of who the dissidents were, what they were, and what the nature of their command was like. There were no dissidents that were commanded by Joshua Nkomo to Mr. Tabengwa, Lookout Masugu, and others. You will notice that even the current establishment um, uh, led by Emerson Nangakwa himself is a dissident establishment that cannot survive without dissidents. When those dissidents are there, are not there, they create them. You are told that they are Mashurugwis, uh, they have raided this mine, they have robbed this uh, place, uh, they have killed these villagers. If you look at how the police react to those Mashurugwis, how the police respond to that, you realize that there are no Mashurukus. These are part of the state security and insecurity mechanism. Participating in the uh, gold wars, diamond wars, and other wars for resources that the president, his friends, uh, and others are participating in, as well-known black marketeers that are participating in the plundering of resources in Zimbabwe. And the fight for my, mining claims in Matebeleland, Midlands, and other places. We are told that there are these Mashurukwis, they are mysterious, no one knows where they come from. If you have started Kukura Wundi and how the security minister then operated, you will understand where the Mashurukwis come from, where they report, and who their actual godfather is. Right. Um, in closing, I think, uh, as I said before, the Kukurawundi genocide and its epistemicide sits centrally uh, on the Zimbabwe national question um, and cannot be let to proceed without uh, a resolution. Because um, you cannot imagine or bring to be a true, just and fair community of people called Zimbabweans when part of that community has been isolated for murder at mass scale and nothing has been done about